So hello, everyone. My name is Priyanka Modaparthi. I'm the director of the project on armed conflict, counterterrorism, and human rights at Columbia Law School's Human Rights Institute. And I wanted to welcome you all today to our lunchtime event, which focuses on putting human rights advocacy into action at the UN. I'm so excited to have with me today both a wonderful co-moderator um, and just an incredible speaker with so much experience in UN advocacy that we're all going to learn a lot from. First, let me introduce my co-moderator, uh, Rolda Foez. Rolda is a 2L at Columbia Law School. She's the co-president of RightsLink. She is also the president of Columbia Law Students for Palestine, and she is a student in the Columbia Law School Human Rights Clinic. So very much an upstanding pillar of the CLS human rights community. Our main speaker today is Anna McDonald. Anna McDonald is the former director of, control, of the Control Arms Campaign, an organization that was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Her recent work has focused on the Arms Trade Treaty, which regulates the international trade of weapons. She was a leader in that campaign for the Arms Trade Treaty, and she has subsequently worked to make its provisions universal and effectively implemented. She's currently doing work research and working on a book uh, based upon her advocacy experiences. Anna, why don't I go ahead and turn it over to you? We're all looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Priyanka, and welcome everybody. It's lovely to see that there's so many people um, that have joined for this discussion. I'm going to uh, just share my screen now so that you'll be able to, um, I hope, see a presentation that I shall bring up. There we go. Um, just giving a slight feedback on mine. I don't know if that's a problem that anybody else is hearing. If not, then that's okay. But um, can everyone who is not speaking mute so we can hear Anna clearly and, and benefit from her presentation? Yeah, I think that's okay. So I'm going to be um, sharing with you um, some ideas and strategies from, um, as Priyanka said, experience of campaigning. Um, within the UN context over um, the last 20 years, um, mostly in the humanitarian um, and human rights fora, um, and a lot focused on disarmament, conflict, and peace issues. Um, and perhaps the, the first point I'll start with, which may sound like a really obvious one, um, but it's about being clear and really being very clear about what it is you want to achieve. When we started the campaign for the arms trade treaty, but the first treaty to regulate the conventional weapons trade um, way back in 2003, this was an, an enormous and very ambitious task at a point where almost no government agreed that such an idea was feasible. So we had to be very clear about what our end goal was and then also break it down into the steps that we needed in order to get there. And sometimes um, what you can see with some campaigns is either a shorter term approach, which is very focused on a, an, an immediate goal, but perhaps not taking into account that bigger context and being really clear about what your end goal is, the impact that you want to achieve is really the first step, I would say, towards achieving a successful campaign. And not to worry if governments tell you that that goal is unachievable. When we launched the campaign for an arms trade treaty, we only had three governments that said, um, it was even possible and the rest that said it was a completely crazy idea, which is fine because if governments aren't telling you your ideas are, are impossible and a bit crazy, then you're probably not aiming high enough. But being um, having clarity around that goal um, is very helpful. And it also stops you falling in, I think, into the trap of being activity led. So um, just putting out this quote here where every year when it's ministerial week at the UN, obviously, didn't really happen this year because of COVID, but normally it's a flurry of activity and there's this enormous pressure to have events, run a side event, do a panel, have a reception. And I think it's always really good to think, why? Why are we doing this event? What is it that we're going to achieve with that event? Who are we targeting? Are they gonna be persuaded by this type of activity? Um, and is it the best way to get our message or achieve our aim across? 
And so for that, um, the first step really for us in, in all of our campaigns was conducting a really detailed power analysis. And essentially that means who is it that you're trying to ultimately aim for? Which governments is it that you need to persuade? And what is it that's going to um, persuade them? What is your influence analysis on that? Are you aiming for big governments, the US, Russia, China, who are very unpersuaded perhaps by current um, human rights arguments or rhetoric? Or are you already galvanizing support with governments that agree with you, but you need to build that into a bigger base? Who is it and what is it that is going to um, persuade them? And that leads us on to what I call the theory of change or what is often referred to in nonprofit circles as like, what's your theory of change? And this is where I think we can often see a bit of a leap from the presentation of the human rights arguments and excellent reports and statistics and evidence and to what's actually going to lead to that change. I've been in many meetings over the years where colleagues have presented to a government, here's our latest report on the statistics or analysis in X country. And the expectation is that the audience that you're talking to is therefore going to be persuaded because you've presented such an excellent report with so, so much detailed research. But I would say, well, why? Why are they going to be persuaded by that? If the presentation of facts and figures and evidence was all that we needed to win human rights arguments, then perhaps arguably we wouldn't have some of the governments that we have in place in the in the world today or have had recently in place. We need to really think through what is it that's going to persuade them on top of that? Do we need parliamentarians to help back up our case? Do we need lots of activity at the capital level? Do we need a big public campaign? Is it other governments that are going to build up to influence the government that we want to ultimately influence. But having that really laid out clearly will help enormously in the next stage of designing the strategy. So it's that thinking through what the long-term goal is. And as I said, when we started working for an arms trade treaty, we knew it was gonna take a long time. We knew we were probably looking at five years, 10 years. In the end, it did take 11 years from launching the campaign to getting the, the treaty adopted. And obviously you can't start a campaign with like, what do we want a treaty? When do we want it? In 11 years, it's in, it seems so far away, it's not galvanizing. So we need to break down those goals into achievable steps that we're gonna need to, if we're gonna get this in a decade, what will we need in place in five years time, four years time, three years time, and breaking that down into, okay, what do we need to do next week? But starting from that long-term goal, rather than the, the what was often the, um, natural tendency to start from the immediate steps that we can do now um, helps you get a strategy that will ultimately be successful. And then it helps you lay out clearly what the activities are going to be. Do we need to have different streams of activities? We need our research, we need our advocacy, we need our outreach to diplomats at the UN itself in Geneva, in New York, wherever. We need our activities going on around the world. We need our alliances, but having that mapped out is very helpful along with then a timeline so you can figure out what you need to do and when. And then I think a really crucial step when you're getting into the more minutiae or technical detail of the UN is selecting the right forum. So much of the UN works on consensus-based decision-making, which sounds wonderful in practice because it's about everybody agreeing. But what actually tends to happen in practice is that consensus is used as, as a veto. So we see this all the time in the Security Council where one or more of the permanent members will veto a decision or a resolution that others have put forward. For us, when we started campaigning on the arms trade treaty and similarly in work that was done around landmines, cluster munitions, and now on explosive weapons and um, other types of disarmament instruments, Geneva, for example, um, in the uh, um, a conference on disarmament or in the um, CCW, the convention on certain conventional weapons, are for us that re rely on consensus decision making. So it means that one or more governments can just stop a process immediately by objecting to it. So we took our campaign to the UN in New York and specifically the General Assembly and its subcommittee, um, first committee, which works on international security and disarmament. And the advantage of that is it's a voting based forum. Resolutions are put forward and at the end of the month, governments vote on them. So we knew then we would have a chance for success because we could build up that majority and it would be less possible for a major power to block it. Secondly, it's Will there be access to civil society and observers? Can you actually get in and talk to the people that you want to talk to? 
Conversely, in Geneva, um, the two fora that I mentioned, while they're restrictive in terms of decision making, they actually have had um, relatively good access in terms of observers and civil society being able to go to go in. One of them, the CCW, allows NGOs to relatively freely speak and make interventions, for example. Other for um, in, the, in New York, the Security Council, much harder for observers to actively participate. You can go into the visitors gallery, but being able to speak is a whole different matter and a complex process of working with governments to obtain that. So thinking through about, do we need to be able to speak in this fora to influence? Do we need to be in the room? What is gonna be the access for us is really key. And then figuring out, are we galvanizing support or are we changing minds? So are we going into a, um, a forum where most of the governments agree with us, but we need to really push them to actually take action? Or are we going into a forum which is highly politicized Human Rights Council, for example, where it's going to be extremely difficult to change minds and therefore we're going to have a very uh, need to have a very thought through and detailed strategy to be able to do that. Then we go on to like build what I call building noise, but otherwise we could call um, popular mobilization or public campaigning. What's the pressure that we need around our issue? And is this an issue that's already on the agenda? It's already topical. Everybody's already talking about it, but we've got a specific human rights demand around it. Or is it an issue that governments aren't even considering and is considered so marginal that we've actually got to find ways to get it onto the agenda? We've struggled with that, say, in over the uh, recent years within um, disarmament in trying to get um, the issue of the conflict in Yemen more prominently featured and discussed, because while it's in the news, it's not the top issue that governments are focused on. Other conflicts are taking greater priority despite the horrific humanitarian human rights concerns there. So how are we gonna build noise around that and where do we need to do that? Who is most going to influence decision makers? Do we need massive rallies on the, on the mall to be able to get decision makers to take notice? Or might it be about strategically placing an opinion piece in a key um, media outlet? Or might it be taking advantage of social media and building up noise that way? What's your resources is really key. We, throughout our campaign on the arms trade treaty, while we did have big movement organizations involved, I was at Oxfam at the time and Amnesty International was our very close partner along with many others around the world. In some senses, we were relatively well resourced. In other senses, we were tiny compared to the enormity of what we are up against the arms industry. So we had to be smart about it. And social media um, was, a, was key for us in that because it's a way that we could amplify our message without needing million dollar budgets. It's a way that we could take our message and encourage others to repeat it out to others. And it's a way that we could punch above our weight and build a bigger noise perhaps than what it looked like we actually were in, in numbers of, of persons. And then thinking about when's the right time for your noise is really important. If there's a resolution coming up at the Security Council that you're really trying to get support for and getting it through, having a massive demonstration the day before may be great for media coverage, but it's not going to change any government's positions because those positions are going to be set at least several days, if not weeks before, if it's something that's such a big issue as a vote at the Security Council. So you're going to need to time in when to try to get that pressure going so that it influences the politicians you're trying to reach who are then going to send the instructions that you want them to send to the diplomats who will be taking the actual, uh, making the actual vote or making the arguments at the UN itself. And here I think we can't underestimate the importance of coordinated outreach. So sometimes, and particularly here in New York where we've got the UN headquarters, we think about all the activities that we want to do here at the at the UN, um, maybe their their media actions outside the UN itself. Maybe it's all the meetings with diplomats. Maybe it's media work, but we need to think about the other fora where the UN exists that we might need to be reaching at the same time. Geneva is obviously crucial if we're looking at human rights. But where, what about the regional centres, be it Brussels for the European Union or Addis Ababa? for the African Union or others around the world, how might we reach out to allies to be able to build up support there? And again, in the campaign for the arms trade treaty, this was absolutely crucial for us that we were seen to be a big global campaign and then we did have 
an active movement going on in multiple countries around the world so that this was coordinated activity. So if you were the government of France, for example, you were getting the same messages from civil society through your diplomats in New York, but also in Geneva, also in Brussels, and then also in, in, your, in your capital Paris at the same time, so that the pressure is really building and it's helping to um, achieve that pressure point that you need to persuade a government to take the action that you're trying to move them across. So then you've got this in place, you start to get the meetings with the important governments or key political contacts you're trying to reach. Again, the, the risk can be that getting the meeting can become the goal in itself or be perceived as that. So it's enormously exciting to get a meeting with political leaders. This is uh, myself meeting with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the president of Liberia, who I greatly ad admired, um, still do at, at the time. It's thrilling to get such a meeting, but it's not the end in itself. And if you allow it to be the end in itself, it can reduce the importance of making sure that you've got a clear action goal in mind. What is it I'm trying to achieve with this meeting? What would I like this important person I'm meeting to do as a result of the meeting? And what's going to be the follow up? Too often, I think we see human rights groups putting out almost self congratulatory messages, had a great meeting with the with the leader of X or Y today. And I think, again, my question would be, what made it a great meeting? What did they commit to? What's your follow-up action? When are you meeting them again? Did you change their mind? These are all really important when we're trying to think through the change we're trying to achieve. So in planning for that, really doing your research on the person or state that you're meeting is crucial. Often you will be meeting um, with a, a diplomat or um, officials uh, for a particular Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for example, who will be extremely well informed on the issue that you're talking to them about, particularly if they're the government that you're coming to criticize for their human rights um, practices in some way, they're going to be prepared, they're going to have been be briefed. Sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes you might meet people who are new into the role and, and therefore you're playing a helpful role, but the safe uh, assumption to make is they're going to know their stuff. So you need to know your stuff. If you're presenting a report, make sure you've read it through thoroughly yourself and that you've got the key points from it that you're um, wanting to put forward. Role play in advance. Um, it might sound uh, silly perhaps, but this is something that we did a lot in training sessions that we would have with our campaigners before big meetings. We would practice and role play um, advocacy meetings with key diplomats where a more experienced campaigner might play the part of the diplomat Others would play the part of the campaigners and we'd watch each other and offer critiques back. And it can help to build your confidence if you're um, relatively new to conducting advocacy meetings. And it's also really great practice to think about the sorts of arguments you might be presented back with and how you're going to deal with that. Because you, you've got to come back to your goals of what it is you're trying to achieve in that meeting and what will therefore make it a successful meeting. And so absolutely crucial is what's the follow-up action at the end? So thank you very much for the time that you've taken to meet with me. And as agreed, we will now do X, Y, Z. Is it that you've asked them to, to support a particular resolution? Is it that you've asked them to meet with representatives perhaps of a marginalized group that you're representing? Is it that you want them to contact another government? But whatever it is, be clear on that and be sure to write to make sure that you send a follow-up note to cement that action and keep going. And it might take many, um, many such meetings to, to, to achieve that, but knowing what that is, knowing your, your own stuff, knowing your own subject matter well, will help you in, in building that relationship with the, the key targets and helping to move them towards the change that you're trying to achieve. And then it's obviously crucial to think about who is best to deliver the message that you're you're trying to get across. So we worked as part of a global coalition and it meant that we were able amongst our colleagues to have the most appropriate person often deliver the message. This is my colleague Radia who works um, uh, with Montana, a Yemeni organization for human rights. So when we were talking about Yemen um, at a major meeting, of course it made, se made sense that Radia would be giving the key presentation on that because she's Yemeni and she's an expert on that, on that subject matter. Similarly, um, perhaps when we were trying to uh, do work to influence China on the arms trade treaty and we knew 
and were very aware of the skepticism around uh, the perception of Western NGOs, it was our African colleagues um, from uh, NGOs who interacted mostly with Chinese diplomats, which was much more successful and led to a much better reception um, than if those from European countries such as myself had attempted to be building those relationships. And then in that thinking about your allies and thinking creatively about this too. We worked with many um, smaller countries, um, Trinidad and Tobago, for example, punched way above their weight in the arms trade treaty negotiations for a relatively small country of 2 million people. But numbers matter, especially if you've, as I was mentioning earlier, you've gone for a voting based forum. So 15 countries that make up CARICOM is a significant voting block. So being able to work with um, multiple smaller countries matters when you're looking at something such as building up to a vote or a resolution where you're trying to get um, a critical mass in favor. And it also means that you can gradually snowball that out into building support amongst more and more countries. We had a, a strategy of trying to get one champion government in each region that we, that we thought, A, where we had influence with that government to some extent, B, where we knew they would influence other governments and see where they're championing the issue would then help to elevate it to such a point that it would help build this general global alliance. And that worked much better than, a, say, a scattergun approach of trying to reach everybody. Sharing ideas, of course, is it really uh, is, a, is a, a part of developing that alliance, trying to look at how that we might mutually um, work together, what is the partnership and building up trust with the governments that you're working with and the individuals within those governments. I think one of my key learnings over the, the um, many years working at the UN is that the importance of the individual diplomat and the individual NGO person is, is significant as much as the position of the country. Because if you find the people who are passionate about an issue as you are, and who care about making the, ch the change as much as you do, then building a relationship with them and being able to develop a partnership way of working can be really, really significant. And time, time and again, we found that partnerships we'd made with um, key allies, Nigeria, uh, pictured here, for example, in Africa, Ghana, South Africa, others, key governments in, in Latin and Central um, America and key governments in the Caribbean and the Pacific, was really crucial to be able to push forward a progressive human rights agenda in what was quite a difficult um, and, and, and at the beginning hostile environment. So we did that by being of value. So we helped governments who might not have been able to have the access to statistics and information and evidence. We were able to provide that for them. Reports that we produced from Oxfam, for example, on the relationship between socioeconomic development and the arms trade proved very valuable for many African governments and making their own case to other governments. We were able to reach out to delegations perhaps that bigger governments might find harder to reach to because they didn't necessarily have that trust relationship or active um, programs going on as Oxfam Amnesty and others we were working in so many countries that we did have an entry point sometimes that enabled us um, to reach far and wide and then we demonstrated trust so if you've built a relationship up with a government and they are demonstrating that trust with you to the point that they are showing you say the draft text of something a resolution um in the treaty it's really really important obviously to respect that that trust and and not therefore leak it to the press not tell others if you've been asked not to if you're go to a confidential meeting and you're allowed into that confidential meeting, of course you don't then tweet about it or otherwise share the information. Maintaining that trust is really crucial. And then lastly, just to touch on, I think, what are the some of the key challenges that I think we're all facing in the human rights field, which I hope can then lead on to um, discussion. Obviously the COVID uh, pandemic itself has been a major challenge, firstly for the um, prioritization that many governments have had to take um, around the prevention and control of COVID vis-a-vis -vis other issues, um, for the human rights implications there have perhaps been in some um, environments because of the restrictions that have been placed upon populations and just because of the sheer difficulty of getting any other issue onto the agenda. The um, increase in authoritarian regimes that we're um, seeing around the world. I was looking at statistics recently about how the 
majority of the world's populations for the first time in a, quite a number of decades and living under now non-democratic rule as opposed to democratic rule presents significant challenges for how to push forward an issue such as human rights. I think one way, and it, there, I think there are pros and cons of this, but when we were pushing human rights, we were pushing it through around, around the Arms Trade Treaty, we were pushing it through fora that were not considered human rights, such as um, disarmament or conflict reduction forums, and sometimes finding ways to push your agenda in a way that isn't being seen to um, directly conflict with those who are, who are opposed to your agenda can be a, a smart way of, of doing it as long as you're not completely losing um, the value and ownership of, of human rights as a concept in doing that. Um, the reduction of civil society space um, that has taken place um, and that's both as a consequence of COVID. So the UN has been shut for the majority of this year for, um, uh, for actually many staff as, as well as observers and nonprofit organizations. Conferences are not taking place, meetings are not happening. The normal way of working isn't happening. It's much harder to therefore get in and talk to people. And combined with the increase in authoritarian regimes, it's leading in many environments to a worrying shrinking space for civil society. Conversely, I'd say there are opportunities with the increase in forums like this, with Zoom and stuff, if we think of it creatively and if we're able to persuade those in power to think creatively about it, actually we could be using online technology to enable many more people directly impacted by human rights to be able to present directly to decision makers. You don't have to fly somebody for two days from a Pacific Island to address the Security Council if you can get them on Zoom. And can we use this as an opportunity for much more direct um, hearing from those who, who are affected and speaking on behalf of their communities rather than interlocutors. And then lastly, um, perhaps the very institution of the UN itself and what can be quite creakily slow and perhaps arguably outdated systems. It takes the UN a long time to respond to things. It still is, although many strides have been make and made in terms of gender equality at the UN, it is still majority a forum of um, older men in suits. It's not a gender equal um, environment. Um, it's not a race equal environment. It's not equal in, in many other aspects. How can we use also what's emerging in terms of a greater use of, of technology and perhaps the democratization of commentary through social media to perhaps help challenge some of these outdated systems? And a bigger question of like, is, is the UN itself prepared to adapt and, and change and evolve in the way that we've all had to in this tumultuous year to be able to tackle um, these, these changes. So I will stop there um, with the presentation um, part of it. And I look forward to your, your own comments, questions and, and uh, any other contributions. Yeah, so everyone, this is a great time if you want to turn on your camera um, and you know, use the raise hand function to ask any questions. Um, if you're not comfortable or if you're not in a place where that's possible, you're also welcome to drop any questions in the chat and I will read those out loud. We're not immediately seeing any questions. Perhaps uh, Rolda and I can ask some to get things started. So Anna, I have a few questions for you. Uh, and the first is, what are some of the changes that you anticipate we might see from an incoming US administration with the Biden administration in place? How would you expect that to affect uh, advocacy at the UN? Rauda, do you want to add anything? And we'll give. Her uh, we do have a, We do have a chat question as well. So maybe. Uh, so someone asked, um, "What are we doing about the changing model of producing and selling weapons of mass destruction?" Which I think uh, might actually connect to the question you just asked, Priyanka. Thanks. I mean, I think there's a expectation generally that we may see more of a return to uh, an embrace of multilateral diplomacy with the incoming administration and already with 
um, the suggested nominations that have been put forward for a new US ambassador to the UN, for example, and other officials who will be working on foreign policy. While um, they're quite centrist in terms of their political views, we're also seeing perhaps a return to the value of experience and diplomatic skill um, as opposed to the previous administration, which had a dismissive a approach to that and a very, uh, which led to a, a very difficult environment, I think, for many of the discussions that were taking place at the, uh, um, at the UN. The withdrawal from so many instruments that, the, that took place under the Trump administration is perhaps something that we might see an important reversal of. Obviously, Biden's committed to reversing the pullout of the Paris Climate Agreement. I'm hopeful that we might see a similar reversal in the um, US pullout of the arms trade treaty. Um, it, was a, it was a huge success for us when the US um, via John Kerry signed um, the arms trade uh, treaty um, in, in uh, uh, back now so seven years ago. Um, they have not moved to ratify it as over 100 governments have, but the signature itself was an important political commitment. And the Trump announcement a year ago to effectively nullify um, that as a, as a way of uh, pleasing the, the NRA um, in particular was a, a very negative step. And hopefully that might be also something that is um, reversed through the, the Biden administration along with other multilateral um, um, instruments. Um, the, uh, and I think around the weapons of mass destruction, one interesting development that took place after the um, uh, trade treaty was through our uh, sister coalition, the International Campaign to Abolish nu Nuclear Weapons, who um, successfully campaigned and helped to secure um, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, the TPNW, which is a ban instrument um, effectively outlawing um, nuclear weapons. Now, none of the uh, nuclear weapon producing or owning countries have signed that treaty. Um, but the point of it really is that it, it's a, what they have uh, achieved through securing that treaty, which um, uh, ICANN won the Nobel Peace Prize for three years ago, um, is the stigmatization and the, the clear enshrining in international law that weapons of uh, such weapons of mass destruction are, are inherently illegal. And the International Committee of the Red Cross and others made the case repeatedly that there was a huge legal gap, that there were so many weapons that were outlawed because of their indiscriminate impact on civilians, biological weapons, chemical weapons, for example, that it was kind of crazy that nuclear weapons that by their very design are indiscriminate and um, capable of such mass destruction of the, the planet were not um, uh, a subject to such illegality. And now they are. And I, and I think it's about often the steps towards achieving big change are about changing the debate along the way. So yes, the, TV, the that treaty in itself has not stopped nuclear weapons. Like the next day, nuclear weapons did not disappear, but it has shaken things up significantly and it has put pressure on nuclear weapon owning and producing countries. And that is helping to galvanize and build a bigger global community that will um, uh, um, continue that battle, hopefully. Thank you, Anna. We do have a hand raised. Um, uh, Davies, would you like to go ahead? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Anna, my name is Davis McCoy, uh, on the Bauer Foundation Scholar at Columbia University. And one of the last campaigns I did before taking on the Bauer Foundation Scholarship actually a campaign uh, during the time of COVID uh, to convince the UN Security Council to renew the arms embargo against South Sudan, which we worked with uh, mainly one of our partners, Amnesty International. Amnesty International. Uh, and I resonate a lot with what you've said, especially about campaigning in the time of COVID and uh, the sort of opportunities that were created for organizations to come together in situations where they could not physically convene or do the, uh, the usual campaign tactics, uh, which were delegations or side meetings and that to rely on technology. So I just had a two-part question, uh, the first of which uh, is in the aftermath of COVID, uh, are civil society organizations or coalitions, I used to work for Christ Action, which was a convener and catalyst of uh, coalitions, are coalitions going to be able to use the same, same tools uh, going forward uh, or should we revert uh, back to the traditional methods of convincing or will there be a diminishing returns, for example, to how much campaign you can do online? 
And then secondly, specifically uh, on the arms embargo, I know this is not uh, specifically related to the arms treaty, uh, but it's, it's, it's something that's really, really important for the campaigning community that's related uh, to arms control, uh, is that we found ourselves uh, falling into the same, same patterns uh, of campaigning uh, on the arms embargo or issues relating to arms of the UN Security Council along the existing power configurations. And by this, I mean, for example, uh, the power analysis that you also mentioned will almost always indicate that the African, the A3, the African member states uh, would be consequential in determining whether uh, China, uh, Russia, or the US would pull a veto on the arms embargo. So just looking forward, uh, in, you know, 10, 20 years from now, uh, how do civil society organizations make uh, terms such as the arms embargo not become a dirty word uh, for the A3? Thanks. Thank you so much. We also have another hand raised. Anna, would you like to answer that question first or get the other one as well? Uh, maybe I'll take this one as it was quite, it's got quite a number of parts to it and uh, right. great, great questions. Um, I think it's, I think it's a really good question about whether we'll revert back to using the same tools um, post COVID or whether in fact we should. I'm always a believer that there's, there's no reason to carry on doing the same thing um, if there are new ways of doing things and if we can think of, um, if, if we thought through more effective ways of achieving our goals. And I, I think that definitely applies to um, side events and the like. And I, I mean, I, I don't know, been to, convened, spoken at and been to hundreds of side events in my time. And I think sometimes an awful lot of effort goes into organizing an event and then sort of anxiously waiting like the host of a party to see who might turn up. And one of the things that we started doing um, within the Armstrong Treaty campaign is, is actually having invite only events instead. We were like, we would organize these side events and the purpose of them was because we were trying to get XYZ government to come because we wanted them to hear something we had to say. So we're like, well, why don't we just specifically invite those governments then? Which kind of sounds obvious, but I think, again, we don't always think through what is it we're trying to achieve with an event. And if you spent so much money and time and effort in organizing a side event, and then what happens is that very junior members of a delegation are sent to it or none at all from the ones that you want to come, and perhaps all your supporters turn up, but they're just there to show support rather than to be persuaded, then arguably you're not achieving much with that. And I think thinking about how COVID and uh, the simultaneous expansion of social media and the use of digital tools is transforming how we communicate. I think we should be thinking, how do we use this and build on this? And are there creative ways that we can utilize these tools to help us in our advocacy? I do think that personal relationships remain important and that some, is something that I hope we can return back to because I think um, the building of trust and relationships with uh, key diplomats is really important and the building and galvanizing of trust and support between NGOs and between colleagues is really important and you can't only do that on online however good you we become at the tools so I think that's important but I, I hope we also embrace in increasing ways of um, uh, uh, achieving change in in new fora and on the um, South Sudan embargo question. Yeah, I agree. It can it can be extremely frustrating with mandates and mandate renewals at the Security Council to see things um, repeatedly blocked or not progressing. It, one of the reasons that we pushed for the arms trade treaty in the first place is that we saw that arms embargoes are a, a, a really something that's often are put in place when the death toll or the suffering has already reached a critical point, what we call the body bag approach, when there are so many body bags appearing, then an arms embargo is put in place. But arguably it's too late if you're looking at an arms embargo. That means that there are so many weapons already in the hands of those who are using them to abuse that so much death and suffering has been caused. So the point of preventative instruments like the ATT is to try to stop us getting to that point. It doesn't reduce the fact that we will need uh, um, still need arms embargoes amongst our tools to deal with arms proliferation. But I'd argue that the emphasis is, is should be more put on the preventative tools and making those work effectively and less on the responsive tools, but, which we need, but they really are a reactive and um, um, sort of last, re last resort um, type activity. Thank you, Anna. Um, I do know we have a number of chat questions. At first, um, Griz Griselda, you can go ahead and ask your question. 
Hi, thank you very much. This is Chris Zalder from South Africa. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Um, I'm a survivor of human trafficking and prostitution. Um, I'm the author of the book called Exit also, and I have been on so many platforms in doing advocacy work as an abolitionist around uh, the issue of human trafficking and um, prostitution. But my question is to you, um, advice to as to me as a survivor and also you know some advice of how, how important is it for survivors to be in the center of policy making are we just allowed to go on the stage and be this moment stage or are we also assisted through the process of that policy change because for the past three years i literally feel like i've been extra exploited because there was no feedback there was no follow-up towards the work I do. Um, it hasn't stopped me from South Africa. I still continue to do it. But just your advice on how important is it for survivors to be in that center and how important is it in that process also? And what should I do as a survivor um, when I don't get the feedback, when I don't see the impact or the resource coming back to me on the, uh, you know, on, on the impact of doing advocacy work and bringing in prevention around that? Thank you very much. Thanks. I think that's a really important question. And we, we worked with survivors very closely um, uh, and still do throughout the arms trade treaty campaign. And I think their um, participation was absolutely crucial. And I think one of the things that we tried to do, I, I don't think we, we always got this right, but we strive to do it. And I think we got better at it during the duration of the campaign is that um, survivors amongst our campaign were working alongside us not to be uh, not to be used for their stories, but we, we had survivors in the campaign who were in the policy team. We had survivors in the campaign who were in the media team, survivors who were in the creative team. And the point was that survivors were, should be integrated across all of our various um, thematic or geographical teams and not just be seen as a, a separate group. And that was um, very important for us as a, as a sort of principal way of working. Um, but also to recognize that survivors are not there um, solely because of the, the, the issue or that they are surviving, right? Survivors are people with skills that they are contributing in, in multiple ways and we need to respect that. I think secondly, we tried to put in place essentially safeguarding processes for people when they were um, talking about their, their stories as survivors. We tried very hard to recognize that recounting um, a story of that can produce a, a, an awful lot of grief or um, relive the suffering is, extreme, is extremely draining for somebody and it's an extremely brave thing that they're doing and we must ensure that we are providing all, all necessary support and allowing that person to be utterly in charge of telling their story. Right? So if somebody's saying that's enough, I've done three media interviews today and I, I don't want to do any more, there's another six waiting but I just can't, then we utterly respect that and that's completely fine because we're there to support survivors and try to reduce the number of survivors there are in the future, not re-traumatize people. And thirdly, um, I think if you're finding that people are not listening to that, then I would, all I can suggest is to try to reach out to the decision makers within that organization um, and ask for a discussion about um, the safeguarding measure, measures and policy approach to survivors within that campaign. We had a, um, a very, um, effective uh, such advocate within our campaign um, who was a survivor herself and she um, made representation on behalf of other survivors and would say look I think we need to change the way that we're working say media interviews an example I just gave for example um, and helped us change that and really helped us uh, the rest of the leadership of the campaign listen to that and say you're absolutely right and here's how we'll try to change our approach going forward. Um, so I think the, the way in which you presented that question, presenting it to the decision makers in the campaign, um, would would be very it would be very valuable. All right, um, we do have a number of questions in the chat. Uh, I'll try to give you a couple at a time that are a bit similar. So, um, uh, you know, there's a question asking, you know, taking into consideration 
the view that the UN is fairly slow and not particularly innovative that you that you mentioned earlier, how do we tackle these challenges now that the budget is frozen, and it's becoming more difficult to get funds for new programs? And what would you, what would you suggest noting these difficulties? Um, kind of on that strain, um, someone asked if you could, you know, you mentioned how important it is to be prepared for meeting with key diplomats uh, for meetings to be successful. So could you elaborate on steps that you have taken um, to build trust with people on the other side of the fence? Um, and finally, uh, kind of on the same strain of questions on, uh, you know, working within this structure, um, do you have any recent examples of promising or best practices in using ICT to increase civil society participation in UN dialogues, um, especially in light of COVID restrictions? Um, I think the first question around um, the slowness and the difficulty with budgets and so on. Yes, I, I think that is going to be a massive pressure on the nonprofit sector clearly for the next few years is that we're, we are unfortunately going to see a, a reduction in in the funding that that is available across the board and I think that underlines even more the importance of working collaboratively and collectively as as far as we can we can I think end up repeating ourselves and repeating the amount of effort that's um, involved if we're all in our little bubbles trying to work individually on our particularly where it's single issue campaigns but the more that we can come together and create synergies around that and pool our resources the more effective we can be so in our, our coalition for example none of the organizations outside of the two big movement ones of Oxfam and Amnesty had teams that that worked across the gamut of you know research policy media social media um, organizing popular activities parliamentary work but what we could do collectively is that there would be people in one organization that did have skills in that area. And so they would work and lead the social media team for the entire coalition, for example, um, and likewise with other skills. We tried to pull together some um, basic aspects such as logistics and administration, for example, so that we could be more effective in the way that we were organizing simple things like people traveling to meetings and accommodation and so on. Um, that helps to save costs. It also cements the, the the, the, the sense of working together and collective activity. And I think it, it's, it's very effective with governments the more that we work together because it's much more powerful to hear a message coming on behalf of 100 organizations than, than coming um, on behalf of one. Um, how to work with the other side is, I, I think, again, is a, is a really good question. And I guess I'd answer that in two, two ways. I mean, one is I think that we were quite creative in the, the alliances that we developed. So for example, we did at times work in partnership with elements of the arms industry. In the UK, the Defence Manufacturers Association at the time um, joined with Control Arms at the time in the uh, presentation of the first petition calling for an arms trade treaty to the British government. And the reason that they did that is because they wanted to be see themselves as the responsible arms producers, largely uh, producing large scale weaponry for domestic procurement, the, the, the British Army, for example, and did not want to be seen as what they would see as the irresponsible end of the arms trade, weapons ending up in the hands of child soldiers and so on. In that, we had a shared interest. We had a shared goal of pushing the UK government to support the treaty. It didn't mean that we were going to align on everything, and we certainly didn't as the campaign developed, but we did then. And actually finding points of common interest and being able to demonstrate wider alliances like that can be incredibly powerful. Simply, similarly, we teamed up with the international financial sector and did some partnership work around the economic stability argument um, of armed violence and the reduction in investment opportunities that it, pre it presents when a whole region um, is beset with cyclical conflict and armed violence. Again, a, a tactical alliance, but one where there were mutual um, benefits to that. And then in terms of individual countries that you're working through, it's a, it's always, it, it is always a challenge. I think it is about those individual relationships often, and it's about trying to find something that you, that you have in common and something that you can offer um, that diplomat or that government that you're working through, there is always something that there will where there will be a shared interest with almost every um, delegation, and being able to identify that and begin the discussion around that can be the uh, an effective way of building up 
um, some form of, of, of constructive relationship, even where you may not be working as closely in partnership as you would be perhaps with a natural ally um, on human rights. And I think it's, it's always getting, trying to get that balance right between the outside pressure um, where you want to maintain pressure on governments and of course not be not compromising principles or policies and being able to build relationships at the same time on the on the inside where a government is not so turned off by the critical reports that you're producing about them that they won't even see you. And here again, I think the division of labor on the pooling of resources is helpful because you can have those whose role it is to be the agitators banging on the door saying this isn't good enough. And then you have those whose role it is to be on the inside and conducting the meetings. Sometimes it's difficult to be both of those people and it's better not to be. Sometimes you can, but sometimes it's, it's actually better to have that division. And I think that's the way um, in which we can uh, um, make that more effective. And then in terms of using, um, information uh, technology, I mean, I, I would say some of the best examples I've seen where is where um, survivors or those that directly affected by human rights impacts have been able to directly address the Security Council or the Human Rights Council or, or other fora, for example, by Zoom. And that has actually made it easier because they haven't had to travel from wherever they are and they've been able to um, hear that directly. I have seen some instances where there have been virtual tours of places where it may well have been extremely difficult to persuade the governments of concern to concern to visit a particular conflict strewn area physically because of security concerns and, and political concerns and so forth, but actually a virtual tour has been possible. I think that needs to be really carefully balanced so that it doesn't become a complete substitute for the in-person um, field visits and the in-person relationships. But I think that can be in parallel, a constructive and um, helpful um, use of evolving technology. We have just uh, five minutes left in our event. So maybe Arauda, do you want to choose two more questions and we'll end after that? Yeah, I was just gonna say there is uh, there is one, actually, you know, two part question I think is uh, a, maybe a good place to end. Um, someone asks, can the UN deal with growing authoritarianism uh, since utilizing Magnitsky style action seems to be out of the question, what methods do you envision for combating authoritar authoritarianism? And if no action is taken against authoritarian governments within the UN, are you worried about the legitimacy of the UN as an ostensibly representative institution? Uh, I think it's a, I think it's a, an excellent question. I think it's probably beyond uh, me to give a comprehensive answer on that because I, I'd say it's something that the whole human rights community is wrestling with at the moment, actually combined with those governments that are looking at UN reform um, and how with the evolving and developing uh, nature of political and power structures in the world, do we make sense of things like the Security Council where you still have only five governments that are permanently represented and, and many that are not represented at all, for example. Um, I think, I don't have a simple answer to it. I think it's crucial that the UN does try to engage and tackle the issue. I think that perhaps the um, democratization of social media in the sense of direct um, directly hearing from citizens, which is possible, um, is one important way that the UN and its representatives try to continue to ensure that they are hearing not only from the leaders of countries, particularly where those leaders may be authoritarian, but they are also hearing from representatives of ordinary citizens and indeed directly from citizens themselves. And I think we in the human rights community and the nonprofit community need to think carefully and strategically about how we shore that up and how we increase um, that happening. But I also think, you know, like even in the, even in the darkest moments, you, there are shining lights and there are opportunities for change. And I saw a, a wonderful um, quote actually from a, a woman who was working with uh, far right groups in a European country trying to change attitudes towards immigration. And she said, we well, you know when, when the dark is at its, at its, um, essentially when when things are at their darkest that's when you can shine the brightest light and i think that's the the, the kind of hope that we 
do need to to hang on to and remember that even in the dark it, it what seemed like the grimmest years for example over the last few years in this context in the us in terms of human rights there was also amazing progress taking place in particular situations and in particular locations um, and in particular constituencies and that has then built up to a, a bigger change that we may hopefully see now so i think we need to to hold on to that optimism tempered with really good strategy to try to make it happen thank you so much anna yeah big question to end on a lot of food for thought So thank you everyone for attending this event. And uh, I think we all just learned so much from your both whirlwind tour of strategic advocacy, effective meetings, evaluation of your actions, inclusive advocacy, um, and from the many insightful questions that were asked. Uh, this event is being recorded. So it will be available through the Human Rights Institute if you are interested in revisiting the conversation and some of the insights Anna has shared um, or in sharing with others who are not able to attend the event. And then I guess I'll just ask you if you have any parting words before everyone signs off. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for attending. I think it's a good sign um, for human rights advocacy that we've had such a, a great audience in what is a, a, a busy and challenging time for um, you all as students, so um, thank you for your interest and uh, yeah, please keep up with your with your advocacy and with your human rights commitments.